When you imagine police in the 19th century, most people think of the good old wooden truncheon, or perhaps firearms in certain circumstances, but there's actually one element that gets overlooked, and that is swords. And the British police did in fact have their own type of sword. And it gets overlooked and it's quite an interesting piece of history. So uh, I'm Nick Thomas at the Academy of Historical Fencing and bringing you another video on swords and swordsmanship. So to understand the British police sword or police cutlass, we need to kind of look at the context of um, Britain in the 19th century, the introduction of the police forces and the, the basically how they were viewed in terms of from politicians, from the public and what was required of them. So today, um, the British police still are not armed as a general rule. Um, there are specialist firearms officers, but they're still not armed today. And this goes back to the forming of the Metropolitan Police by uh, Robert Peel in the early 19th century. And when he formed it, he absolutely did not want his police officers armed. Is that he saw them as, um, as civilians in uniform, essentially. So he wanted them to very much be part of the community and not seen as a militaristic force. So in various parts of the world in that time, police type forces were often more like paramilitaries, which are, you know, essentially half police, half military, and they usually carry firearms in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. And there was this feel that, feeling that they, they kind of terrorized the people. And Robert Peel wanted the, the police force to be more of the people and, and working within the communities and that kind of thing. And also, this was following the events of things like the Peterloo Massacre. So in 1819, uh, in fact, all sorts of um, uh, protests had started up around mostly voting rights and things like that and workers' rights. And the Peterloo Massacre was one such incident where there was a big mob, of about 60,000 people, and the cavalry were sent in, the yeomanry cavalry. So at that point, up to that point, when you had civil disturbance, what would normally happen is the government or the local officials would call upon the yeomanry, which are, they're a, face, a form of militia basically, and, but they're mounted. And yeah, they called in the yeomanry and it didn't go down so well. So yeah, they just charged into the populace. They killed, I believe, 18 people. Um, it it's went down in history as, a, as an awful event and it, and it basically highlighted the problems of policing the populace and that it's not really a good idea to police them with, you know, essentially a military force you know, mounted cavalrymen with cavalry sabres hacking people to death. And, um, and you can see very much that the police force, as it is, and it was formed by Robert Peel with the Metropolitan Police, very much came out of that period. And it was a time of, as I said, um, calls for, um, for more voting rights and workers' rights and all these kinds of things. And, and that did put increased strain on what was required of any kind of policing element. And that's really important to the Cutlass as well. Now, in the late 18th century, a first form of police was formed, which was the Thames River Police. And they were formed because, well, the Thames, of course, you know, loads of shipping and it was a very, very dangerous place. So bandits were just constantly just stealing stuff, anything that was not nailed down and some stuff that was, the amount of things that were going missing was absolutely ridiculous. And the Thames River Police were formed to protect against that. and because it was, you know, dangerous work with basically, you know, countering dangerous criminals, they equipped them with a form of short sword and it was a, a straight sword for that time. And unsurprisingly, because they're a river force, the sword was called a cutlass. Now, remember what I said about the Metropolitan Police forming up? They didn't want weapons, but as time progressed, it became clear that they might need weapons for certain circumstances. So the police cutlass was never actually carried as a day-to-day -day item. That's not what it was at all. It did not replace the truncheon. The truncheon remained completely the day-to-day -day wear item for, for police officers at that time. But it became apparent that during certain circumstances, you would need something that had a bit more, packed a bit more punch than the truncheon. And so, the police were, in, in many constabularies all around the country that were, that were started up around that time, were issued with a short sword. Now it was only for nighttime duties because of course night duties were generally much more dangerous than day duties. And during civil disturbances, riots, or, or there's a risk of such an event as that. So in that regard, the, the police cutlass was a bit like say riot equipment is today. Not quite because there's the nighttime duties as well, 
but yeah, it's kind of the heavier duty equipments when there's more risk, um, where there's you know major public sort of um, rioting or, or, or sort of uh, or similar events. And so this is an original. This is what's sometimes called the 1868 police cutlass. Although it, this may well have been in service before then, and there certainly were earlier cutlasses that are, that were very very similar. And why would it be called a cutlass? Well, simply put. Cutlass and hanger are the two, sort, two terms in English that are used for a short sword. Hanger is the term used on land, and cutlass is the term used at sea. But they're the same thing. It is just a different term on land to, to sea. And because of the, the heritage, if you like, of where the police came from at that time, and the Thames River Police and their cutlasses, it's kind of no surprise then that the police forces around the country adopting the same thing, although in this case curved now, but it's still much the same weapon, use the term cutlass, so it's no surprise. And there is some crossover between the terms hanger and cutlass. So all it means is, is a short sword. And it can be curved and it can be straight. The, the regulation police cutlass is, is this. It's, it's a lightly curved short blade with a simple um, D-guard on it. And it looks like a small, very small cavalry saber. Unsurprisingly, that's really what it is. And uh, so there you have it. And were they used? Well, absolutely. There's actually lots of examples of them being used for night duties, for rioting and things like that. There are examples of police officers having their, their cutlasses ripped from their hands and used against them. Um, there's, there's incidences of, of, you know, drunk fights with, with you know, with policemen with their sabres, uh, sorry, cutlasses. And there is also some suggestion that many of them may have been left blunt so that they essentially did less damage because a large part of the cutlass was not so much what it could do, but also the deterrent that it posed. Because again, in policing, a huge amount, of course, of, of policing is, is a deterrent, and a sword, inevitably, is more of a deterrent than a, a stick or a truncheon. And there's a possibility that many of them weren't sharpened, so that essentially they were well, a heavy-duty club then, but aren't going to necessarily risk death so badly. That said, my example here is razor sharp. I could still go and cut with this today. It's, it's, it's pretty much as sharp as the sword that I use for test cutting. And the point is very pointy. <laughs> so uh, the, this absolutely is, is, is an offensive weapon. Now the, the originals, uh, mine's actually missing it. So there's a hole there. This was actually a, a button release. So it's a safety catch so that when it drops into the scabbard, it locks in place so that it can't easily be taken, much like a, a lanyard will be used on a pistol today, for example. Uh, and and it would have had a, a fishkin grip on it as well with wire, but there's missing on my example. So that is what the police cutlass is, and kind of when it was used, but then how was it used? Uh, and also, before, before that actually, I will mention, here's another example. Um, this is the Coast Guard and Customs Sword. So at the time of these swords, short swords or cutlasses, we used for all sorts of purposes. And the police example was used also by um, prison officers and sometimes customs and excise and stuff like that. Um, this is the Coast Guard and Customs sword. It's, you know, much the same thing, to be honest. It would have had a, um, a small loop side guard on, on the outside of the, uh, of the guard there originally, although lots of them were removed for easy storage and things like that. So, the cutlass. How was it taught? How was it used? Well, simply put, soldiers were brought in to, to teach. It was very common to recruit former soldiers into the police force because they already obviously had discipline and experience, or you would hope so anyway. Um, and they were often brought in to teach and then the methods that were being used. So there was actually a police manual of swordsmanship, so the police cutlass exercise. And where it derives from is actually the, the army exercise, which you know basically meant, makes sense. So around the Napoleonic period and going in just into the, um, the 1820s, saw a mass standardization of swordsmanship in the British army. So here we have a first edition of Angelo's infantry exercise from 1817. And the Angelos were teaching military swordsmanship from the late 18th century, just not on a, an official army-wide scale. And in 1817, the, uh, the army accepted this Angelo system of swordsmanship. The Navy had already done it in uh, 1813, so just into the end of the Napoleonic period. 
And this had led on from a series of, a, a system of broadsword and sabre and spadroon that had been in use all through the 18th century. So it wasn't a new system by any means. There were little bits added in here and there, but it, it had a long lineage. And this became the official army-wide system for the infantry exercise. And the police, British police force simply looked at this manual and copied it. Uh, the police manual's a little bit simpler because it doesn't, obviously they're, they're not actually fighting on a battlefield, but ultimately the principles are the same. So if you look at the way the guards are used, the way uh, the footwork is done, the way the slips are done, the point work, it's, it's all taken straight out of the army exercise of the day. And they were um, training, for example, the Metropolitan Police were training, you know, every day at one point, so getting in police constantly, training them on, on the fields in London in the use of the cutlass exercise. And it's also worth mentioning at this point that this was also used by the Mounted Police, which is actually kind of strange because from a, a Mounted perspective, you want a longer sword. That's the general rule. On horseback, longer sword, partly because obviously you're so much higher, you need the reach. Um, and partly because you want the blows to be a bit more impactful because it's not about fine fencing. Um, and there's some speculation that some police forces used the uh, light cavalry sabres, the 1821 and the uh, universal 1853 pattern. There's not evidence to back that up, but the, um, the police cutlass exercise does show a three-bar sabre on the cutting diagram, which is, I suppose, a, a partial piece of evidence. And there were some forces, for example, in, in Canada and India, uh, police forces, that did use the three-bar like cavalry sabres and, and the universal um, cavalry sabre of the 1853. So there's a possibility that some British mounted police used longer sabres, but there's not evidence to back that up yet. Um, what there is evidence to back up is that these, the little cutlass, was used on horseback because there are some surviving examples. One, for example, to the Bristol Mounted Police. And, um, and in this particular illustration, you can see the, the Bristol Police practicing mounted exercise because you can look at their, their off hands and their footwork and you can tell they're training for a military style, ex a, a mounted style exercise and not combat on foot. So yeah, they were used both for regular police officers and mounted officers. Now, their, their usage historically, therefore, starts in the police cutlass, starts around about the 1820s. Uh, and if you want to include the Thames River Police, it goes back to 1798. And it extends to, believed to be the last ever usage of the police cutlass to 1910. So, you know, just over 100 years of use. In Britain, firearms were not very commonly used by the police. They were drawn for specific circumstances but very rarely, and usually only more senior officers, whereas the police cutlass was widely used, just not on a day-to-day -day basis, not part of a daily uniform piece of kit. It was kept in the police stations, hung up, and brought out during specific times of dire need, and, as I said, for the night duties, because there's so much more risk to them. And throughout the 19th century, there were constant arguments throughout the UK as to whether the British police should be armed. So even some neighbourhoods that were getting quite violent were petitioning for the police to be armed with both sword and pistol, for example, in some areas. Um, and yet there was also a massive um, feeling towards not militarising uh, the police and therefore not giving them firearms and not letting them carry swords on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have to understand British culture of, uh, and policing culture of the 19th century to understand why, for the most part, the truncheon was all they carried but during certain times, they had this little cutlass. And is it correct to still call it a cutlass today, being as technically speaking, cutlass is the sea term, not the land term? Well, yeah, I would say, of course it is, because it got adopted for that reason. It was called the police cutlass widely across all the police forces, the constabularies, um, in the newspapers, in their own manual that taught the uh, style of swordsmanship. So yes, there's no problem calling this a cutlass today, even though it does cause some, uh, sometimes a little bit of confusion. So um, yeah, there's the, uh, the police cutlass for you. Uh, what does it handle like? Well, it handles like a hanger or a cutlass. There's just no surprise there. So my example is about 750 grams, maybe 800 grams, um, which for its size exactly is not exactly that light. Um, so it actually does pack a little bit of a punch, 
It looks like it might have a sharpened back edge here, but it doesn't. It just tapers towards a good point, but it does have a good sharp edge along its entire length. And there, there you have it. So there is the British Police Cutlass for you. Now, I did draw a lot of information from uh, for this video from this one particular website, which is excellent, which is the, uh, the Police Cells uh, Museum. I will put the link down in the description below. And if you want to check their website out, I would recommend it because they have some really well-researched articles. And if you dig into it, you will find their article on the police cutlass and they'll talk about it for, in, more, in more depth in, in terms of from different constabularies and give some interesting accounts uh, of, of them being used in action. So the, yeah, please check that out if you want to know a bit more. There's the police cutlass. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching and please do subscribe if you haven't already.